thank you very much for uh, for being here to uh, listen to uh, all this information about the CLSA. My uh, role in the CLSA, as Perminder mentioned, is that I'm the site uh, principal investigator at the at uh, the Ottawa site, and I'm also the um, the lead for the psychological health working group, which includes the cognitive beta. So that is what I will be talking to you about here today. I'll talk to you a bit about what the cognitive beta even are I, and give you a couple of examples of some of the work that's being published using these data and then go on to uh, talk to you a little bit about the uh, the follow-up studies, what the current research that we're engaging in or analyses of the data. So I'd like to thank everyone for their, uh, we received, I received many questions about the, the cognitive data. The majority of the questions uh, relating to people have had a lot of questions about cognitive impairment and dementia and uh, concerns about their memory and cognitive functions. So I will do my best to answer those questions for you as I go through the presentation. So let's uh, start, let me just, let's start by just telling you what I mean by the cognitive data. So I'm sure that uh, those of you who are participants are very familiar with the with these tests that I'm going to talk to you about quickly. So uh, everyone, there's a subset of tests that everybody in the CLSA does, uh, irrespective of whether you're in the tracking or the comprehensive cohort. And then we have some tests that we do only with the comprehensive cohort, just because we need people to be uh, present with there are some that have materials that we uh, we need to do in person, you can't do over the telephone. So everybody does the animal fluency test. You'll remember this one where you are asked to name all the animals that you can think of in one minute. Uh, and in the comprehensive cohort, we also do that test, but using letters. So to name all the items that you can uh, think of in one minute with starting with a given letter. Everyone does the mental alternation test. So that's the one where you're switching between numbers and letters, 1A, 2B, et cetera. And uh, th those tests are assessing what we call your executive function. So these, uh, this is sort of like your, your brain's control center that you are uh, managing your resources and paying attention and so on. So uh, also for executive function, people in the comprehensive cohort uh, do a task called the Stroop task. So that is the one where you're asked to name. Um, so you see colors and you see color words, and then you see color words printed in a different color ink, and you have to name the color of the ink. So this is testing the ability to inhibit irrelevant information and, and name the color of the ink rather than reading the word. So we also, so that's executive function. We also have some tasks looking at memory function. So in both, uh, both cohorts, people do the auditory verbal learning test where you're given a word list, you're asked to remember it immediately and then at a five minute delay and also the prospect of memory test. So this is testing your ability to remember to remember. So uh, in real life, that looks something like, oh, I need to remember that I have to buy some milk on my way home from work or something along those lines. So in the, the way that we test it in the CLSA is by looking at uh, whether, so that's the test where you have to remember at some point during the testing session to take the money out of the envelope and give it to the examiner. Uh, and you uh, you are either asked to do it at a certain time or with a cue. And then finally, we measure uh, processing speed. So that's the one with the computer screen where you're pressing, you're responding to items and we're looking at how quickly you're able to do that. So these are the, the cognitive data that we collect. And we also ask people, so since follow-up one, we started asking people questions about their self-perceived memory function. So those are questions like, have you noticed any changes in your memory? Are you worried about those changes? And uh, I'll talk a little bit about, uh, about that, uh, some work we've done using those data uh, in a few slides. So I'm gonna give you some examples. Now, I'll, first I'd like to say why we collect these data. So I know people don't, I, I hear that people don't like cognitive testing. I've done lots of cognitive testing myself and I also don't like it. So I certainly understand that and I very much appreciate people's willingness to do these tasks that they do not, uh, do not enjoy doing. So why do we do this? Well. First, it allows us to track uh, changes in people's cognitive function over time. 
And we can look at the, um, the effects of different events or different health conditions on cognitive performance. So I'll give you an example of that in a moment. We can identify factors that might help people maintain cognitive function. And we can also track the progress of people who are worried if they're losing memory function, even if their memory testing is normal. So there is uh, there are people who will report, yes, my memory I feel like my memory is declining. And then when we look at their memory performance, actually they are they look fine. So this is a really interesting uh, question of what does that mean for somebody to have the self-reported concern about their memory or cognitive function in the, pre in, in the context of normal cognitive performance. So uh, I'm going to highlight now a couple of, there's many studies using the cognitive data. I certainly don't have time to talk about all of them, but I wanted to highlight a, a couple of uh, studies that have been done using these data. So this one that I'm gonna talk about now about tra traumatic brain injury is some work done by my former PhD student, Mark Bedard. So he, he based his PhD work on CLSA data, and he was interested in traumatic brain injury and cognition. So traumatic brain injury is when somebody suffers a, a head injury that results in injury to the brain, and uh, often people will refer to a concussion, which is a, a, a TBI. And so in CLSA, we ask people if they have experienced TBIs in the past, and what he wanted to do was look at performance and cognitive testing in people who've had a, a head injury, uh, both initially and then after three years. So in his thesis, he looked at the data from the from baseline and from follow up one. And so some people who who experience a TBI. Uh, experience also loss of consciousness, some do not. So he was also looking at that as a factor to assess the severity of the TBI. So he wanted to look at their cognitive performance and he was also interested in the role of social support as a predictor of preserved cognitive function. So there have been some studies suggesting that social support is very uh, valuable in terms of preserving cognitive function. It's quite unique to be able to do this kind of study with such a large a group of participants and see if social support can help people maintain their cognitive function in the face of a challenge like a TBI. So what he found was that people with a previous TBI at some point in the past who had experienced a loss of consciousness with that TBI had lower cognitive performance and greater cognitive decline. And this is even years after the TBI. So in, within CLSA, we ask about lifetime uh, traumatic brain injury. It, it doesn't uh, have to be recent. So uh, this is as expected. The a brain injury will uh, have impacts on people's cognitive function. But what was really exciting about this, his findings was that when uh, he asked people about their perceived social support that it suggests that he found that uh, perceived social support can help buffer against this cognitive decline. So what that means is if somebody reports that they have high levels of social support, they show less decline over the course of these three years compared to people reporting lower levels of social support. And this is, there's different types of social support. So CLSA asks about different, uh, different subsets of social support. And what he found was that specifically or particularly emotional support seem to help buffer against cognitive decline. So this is really uh, exciting because it suggests avenues for helping people preserve their cognitive function, uh, even in the face of challenges like a traumatic brain injury. So and I mentioned previously uh, subjective cognitive status. So we know that there are some people that report that they're worried about changes in their memory or cognition, even though their performance on cognitive tasks is normal. So you'll notice, and we ask if you've noticed changes, and we also ask if you're worried about them. So uh, a lot of people, the, over 50% of people report that they uh, have noticed changes, which uh, is, is uh uh, understandable. I would say that I feel like I've noticed changes in my cognitive function in, in the past uh, few years. My memory is not as high as it was when I was 25, but the, critically, we also ask people if they are concerned about um, 
about those changes. So when we're talking about people who have what we call subjective cognitive decline, what we mean is people who say they are concerned, they say their their memory has changed, they say that they're concerned about it, and then when we test them, their performance on cognitive tasks is normal. So of course, people whose cognition is declining or who have cognitive impairment also often report that they're concerned about, about their cognitive, about their memory performance, but here we're focusing on the people who don't show any signs of cognitive impairment. So a critical question in research is what does this mean? Is it that the person is starting to decline, but the changes are too subtle and are not detectable yet with uh, with neuropsychological testing, or it could be that the person is fine and they're just experiencing anxiety or concerns, but so this we would call the, the worried well. And, and so Typically, when you look at people with subjective cognitive decline, there is a subset who are the worried well, and there's a subset who are what we would say in a stage where the patient knows, but the doctor doesn't know yet that there's something wrong. So we, uh, one of the major goals in research is to figure out who of those people are uh, on a trajectory to start experiencing cognitive impairment and who are not. So we've uh, we've started asking people, as I said, in, in the second wave of data collection about their self-perceived cognitive function so we can start to answer these questions. So uh, this is another uh, more work done by a PhD student uh, here at, at, who was here at University of Ottawa at the time she was doing this work. And uh, the, the question was that she was trying to identify the biopsychosocial factors that predict these concerns about cognition. So why do we want to do this? Well, understanding the factors that predict uh, concerns about cognition could help us design interventions to assist people with these, uh, with these concerns. So what she found was that physical factors, surprisingly physical factors, such as phys uh, low levels of physical activity, hypertension, problems with vision, did not predict concerns about cognition. But really what was driving these effects were as uh, psycho, um, psychosocial variables. Um, so depression, uh, perceived, uh, perceived support, and personality traits. So for example, people who are uh, more uh, extroverted are less likely to have concerns. People who are more emotionally stable are less likely to have concerns. People who are very conscientious, this is a, a, again, um, reducing the risk of, of concerns. So why uh, why is this important? Well, when we when you're thinking about conceptualizing subjective cognitive concerns, it is really important to consider psychological and social factors. So this can be relevant both in terms of building theory about what it means to have SCD or subjective cognitive decline, and also from a kind of clinical perspective when you're assessing someone uh, determining uh, how to uh, how to think about their self-reported memory concerns. So what we're doing now is I, we're trying to identify factors that influence the risk of subsequent decline in people with these subjective cognitive concerns, and also examining factors like perhaps social support that might protect against cognitive decline. So this really actually addresses a lot of the questions that I, I received um, about what is it that we can do a uh, to help us, uh, I'm concerned, people say, I'm concerned about my memory. Is there anything I can do to prevent myself from uh, or reduce my risk of, of developing cognitive impairment? So these are some of the, the questions that we're trying to answer now. There were, we were limited in our ability to really study dementia in the early years of uh, CLSA because people at baseline, when they entered the study, everybody uh, was cognitively intact. So what that means is that as uh, the study progresses, we are going to see some of our participants uh, developing cognitive impairment and dementia, and now really is when we're starting to uh, be able to do more research looking at that population. <clears throat> so uh, there's this just a couple, a little flavor of some of the, the work that's been done so far with the, the cognitive measures. Uh, we have lots of other uh, ongoing work. So in collaboration with uh, my colleague, Megan O'Connell uh, at the University of Saskatoon, she's developed a method to detect changes in cognition using the CLSA battery. So she's developed something that, she, that we refer to as the cognitive impairment indicator, which uses the 
uh, scores that we have available from the cognitive testing to identify people who might be at risk of having cognitive impairment. So this is important because, you know, sometimes somebody will get a low score. You can't interpret a single low score as indicating cognitive impairment. So I'm sure you all know this from having done uh, lots of uh, lots of cognitive testing. Sometimes you just there's a test that you don't do well on for for whatever reason. Maybe you're distracted or uh, your brain kind of freezes and you don't, for example, produce very many items when you're asked to name all the animals that you can. But actually, all the other neuropsych scores or the cognitive scores look fine. So this is what we would call a spurious uh, low score. So using this cognitive impairment indicator allows. Uh, allows us not only to identify cognitive impairment within CLSA, but also identify baseline, like how many people show these types of spurious scores, which can be very helpful for, for clinicians when they're, uh, when they're working with clients uh, in, the, in the clinic. So, and we can also use, so a recent uh, study that was just published uh, was looking at shift work as, so this is using this cognitive impairment indicator and identified that shift work is a risk factor for people exhibiting uh, or being at risk for a cognitive impairment. So this is, uh, there's a lot of uh, huge possibilities of all of the factors that we can consider as, uh, potential risks for, for cognitive impairment. And this work is, is just beginning. So this is a paper that came out in just in 2023, uh, showing risks of shift work, which of course disrupts uh, sleep and, and circadian rhythm. So it's uh, uh, not good for cognition. Uh, another really important piece of work that, that we've done as part of the cognitive group with Megan and others is developing norms based on this very large sample. So what do I mean by norms? Well, this is uh, where, so when you are seeing a clinician and they do cognitive testing on you, they need to know what a normal score would look like or what they would expect your score to look like based on factors like age, education level, sex, and so on. So we they will use norms to do that, to determine if somebody looks like they're outside of normal limits on, a, on performance on a cognitive test. But oftentimes the, the number of participants used to develop these norms is a little bit low. So uh, this the CLSA provides a really exciting opportunity to develop very robust norms based on this uh, very large sample. And so this is because we know that cognition is expected to change as we age. There are some uh, areas of cognition where you'll see changes. We call this normal aging. So we're trying to determine when people's cognitive performance changes, if this is normal aging or if there's a cause for concern. And excitingly, the norms are available in both English and French because many people complete their, their uh, CLSA visits in French. So this is uh, really uh, um, useful for clinicians across uh, across. Canada. Uh, we are also looking to identify markers of cognitive decline, and this will, uh, uh, in the future, will allow us to identify risk and protective factors for dementia. And we're also doing work, so Tina mentioned uh, the international nature of work with CLSA. So a study we recently published, Harmonizing. So there are lots of studies in other countries with uh, large-scale studies with older adults, and we harmonized across those studies to determine the optimal way to ask people. So this was related to the questions on subjective cognitive status to identify the optimal way to ask people about their cognitive function. So because there's lots of different ways that you can do this and like you, how's your function compared to other people your age compared to yourself 10 years ago? Are you concerned about it, et cetera? So we've been able to use all of these data sets to, uh, to combine and, and figure out how those questions should best be posed. Uh, so in conclusion, the cognitive data are a com crucial component of the CLSA. We're so grateful that you complete these tests. They allow us to understand the factors driving cognitive health throughout the lifespan. Uh, this can help us assist people in maintaining cognitive health and also identify people who are at risk of cognitive decline. And our ultimate goal is to lead to better quality of life uh, for Canadians and others as well, of course. So uh, that's my, uh, my final slides. Thank you very much for your participation and also for coming here today.